présence et pour votre fidélité. Alors, ce first sur le thème de l'informatique cognitive et les mobiles perspectives d'avenir, il a lieu à l'initiative du professeur Michel Léonard, qui a réuni autour de lui deux intervenants de grande qualité. Tout d'abord, Dean Ho, membre de l'Académie de technologie de IBM, qui s'exprimera en anglais, et puis le professeur Dimitri Constantas, qui est directeur de l'Institut des sciences de l'information à l'Université de Genève, Geneva School of Economics and Management. On peut d'ores et déjà, avant de commencer, commencer par les applaudir chaleureusement. Merci. Alors cette formidable aventure que sont Résonance et ses 15 firsts annuels est rendue possible grâce à la Fédération des entreprises romandes de Genève qui nous accueille ce soir et grâce aux membres Premium Résonance qui s'abonnent pour soutenir, pour publier sur résonance.ch et pour bénéficier de privilèges, notamment de rabais sur des événements organisés un peu partout en Suisse romande. Un merci tout particulier aux partenaires de cette soirée, le Centre universitaire d'informatique, le Institute of Science Services, l'AGFI et le journal Entreprises romande. Alors un rapide retour en image sur les précédents événements qui ont été organisés par euh, Résonance et la Muse. Donc tout d'abord le first, l'effet WOW qui a été donc co-organisé avec un auteur qui s'appelle Jean-Marc Guchetti, dans le cadre du lancement de son ouvrage, l'Effet Wow. Il a eu lieu au Salon B2B et a accueilli 220 euh, participants. C'était le 16 octobre dernier. Euh, Résonance était également partenaire d'un congrès qui s'appelait le, le Trees Future Conference, qui a eu lieu à l'EPFL les 29, 30 et 31 octobre dernier, dans le cadre duquel a eu lieu également un first qui a accueilli 200 participants. Et puis, on a eu le bonheur aussi de soutenir la semaine de l'entrepreneuriat au travers notamment d'un pique-nique spécial en présence des étudiants à la Muse le 17 novembre. Et puis vous pouvez ouvrir vos agendas pour les prochains événements à ne pas manquer, ce qu'on n'arrête jamais. Donc, un vernissage, un vernissage d'un bouquin qui s'appelle « L'art de développer son réseau relationnel » qui a été coécrit par Geneviève Morand, qui est la présidente de la Fondation Muse, et Michel Sintès, qui est le co-inventeur de la Daytona Rolex. Donc, qui font le vernissage de cet ouvrage à la Muse, à Genève et à Lausanne, les 15 et 16 décembre lors du pique-nique. C'est libre et gratuit. Voilà, on a aussi le bonheur de co-organiser très régulièrement, à peu près un jeudi chaque mois, une causerie qui s'appelle les causeries du jeudi. Et la prochaine, elle a lieu le 18 décembre à la Muse Genève, <coughs> sur le thème de, euh, du numérique au chevet de la santé. Et elle sera animée par euh, Christian Lovis. Voilà, c'est également libre et gratuit. Vous pouvez d'ores et déjà vous inscrire. Je vous rappelle aussi les pique-niques de la Muse, qui devient mythique, avec ses à peu près 2000 participants par année maintenant. C'est un format libre et gratuit aussi, qui a lieu tous les lundis à Genève et tous les mardis à Lausanne, et qui a pour but de faire un grand tour de table des projets, des besoins, euh, des porteurs de projets dans un esprit d'entraide. Et enfin, une manifestation à ne pas manquer, c'est la Suisse des talents. Elle a eu lieu pour la première fois cette année ici à l'Affaire Genève en janvier. Et on a le bonheur d'organiser la seconde édition l'année prochaine à la HE Arc Neuchâtel le 18 mars 2015. C'est la grande fête de tous les lauréats de prix à l'entrepreneuriat et à l'innovation de notre région. Voilà, et puis quelques informations pratiques pour les personnes qui souhaitent se connecter au Wi-Fi. Vous pouvez le faire avec les identifiants qui sont inscrits juste ici. Vous pouvez tweeter pour les, les geeks sur le twitter.com euh, slash résonance avec le hashtag réseau first et suivre résonance sur Facebook. On essaye aussi régulièrement de mettre en ligne les vidéos des firsts sur la chaîne YouTube Résonance TV. Je passe maintenant la parole à Madame Véronique Canton, qui est la directrice du département communication de la Fédération des entreprises romandes de Genève. Merci de l'accueillir. On peut l'applaudir. Bonsoir à toutes et à tous. À mon tour, j'ai le très grand plaisir de vous accueillir ici au nom de la Direction générale de la Fédération des entreprises romandes de Genève pour vous souhaiter la bienvenue à ce first portant sur l'informatique cognitive et les systèmes mobiles. Un sujet technique et très pointu s'il en est, mais je crois que ce soir les intervenants vont savoir vous les expliquer, certainement mieux que je ne l'ai tenté de vous le faire dans une très courte définition. Alors avant de comprendre ce qu'est l'informatique cognitive, il faut se rappeler que les systèmes cognitifs sont des systèmes complexes de traitement de l'information, capables d'acquérir, de mettre en œuvre et de transmettre des connaissances. Il s'agit de phénomènes comme la perception, l'intelligence, le calcul, le langage, le raisonnement et la conscience. 
De nombreux domaines sont touchés par ces notions, comme la linguistique, l'anthropologie, la psychologie, les neurosciences, la philosophie ou encore l'intelligence artificielle. Si l'on rapporte ces notions, ces définitions à l'informatique, alors on comprend que l'informatique cognitive permet d'utiliser les données en leur donnant du sens. Le sens permet de passer de la donnée brute à une donnée permettant l'action. On pense souvent que les machines servent à remplacer l'homme pour des travaux fatigants, fastidieux ou répétitifs. Aujourd'hui, les machines remplacent aussi les hommes pour des tâches à forte valeur ajoutée. L'informatique cognitive introduit ainsi une révolution dans la relation que nous avons eue avec l'informatique. L'ordinateur ne prend plus des décisions sous la forme « oui » ou « non », mais il arrive à agréger plusieurs informations et en faire sortir un résultat intelligible et dans de nombreux cas « intelligent » au sens où nous, les hommes, nous l'entendons. L'ordinateur est désormais capable de réponses subtiles qui laissent augurer de développements passionnants. Je vous souhaite une très belle conférence et je vous remercie pour votre attention. Alors, on va entrer à présent dans le vif du sujet. Et pour ce faire, j'ai le bonheur d'accueillir le professeur Michel Léonard, qui est à l'initiative du FIRST de ce soir. Merci de l'accueillir très chaleureusement. Michel Léonard. Bonsoir, merci Claire, merci à la Fédération des entreprises romandes pour nous accueillir pour ce FIRST. Euh, ce que j'ai voulu, euh, dans le cadre des lumières numériques, euh, montrer aussi l'importance de, des nouvelles formes qui sortent de l'informatique. Et faites attention parce que ça va venir beaucoup plus vite qu'on ne peut le penser. C'est dans le présent qu'il faut raisonner tout de suite. Et c'est tous... Finalement, il y a eu une très bonne introduction précédemment de, de la cognition, de l'informatique cognitive. Et euh, il y a des questions de valeur ajoutée qui vont venir. Il y a effectivement des questions aussi d'emploi. Mais surtout, il y a une question de comprendre que ce monde, il ne faut pas le subir. Au contraire, il va falloir innover avec. Et que, en fait, quand je dis il va falloir, on dirait presque une obligation. Mais, en fait, mais les personnes qui sont dedans, ils ont plaisir à travailler là-dedans. J'ai demandé à deux personnes qui, pour moi, sont très importantes, de venir vous présenter, d'une part, l'informatique cognitive telle qu'elle a été développée chez IBM avec le succès qu'on connaît de la machine Watson, j'ai demandé au docteur Zimho, de membre de l'Académie technologique d'IBM. C'est une personne qui est pour moi en tout point remarquable. Il était déjà venu ici faire une conférence remarquable dans un first. Et euh, vous allez avoir un exposé conséquent, mais intelligible. Je ne le connais pas son exposé, mais il est tout le temps comme ça. Il ne va pas changer aujourd'hui. Et après, euh, ce sera euh, mon collègue Dimitri Constantas. D'abord, je passe la parole à Zim Ho en te remerciant chaleureusement d'être venu exprès à Genève pour participer à ce FIRST. Merci Zim Ho. Thank you very much for uh, your nice introduction. And thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be back here again with you. And uh, it's my pleasure to talk about cognitive computing because I think this is a, a turning point in uh, our computation, right? Uh, okay, uh, just as a Mm, Professor Leonard Toulouse, I'm a member of the Academy. But any of you know what the Academy is about? Well, I guess not. Eh? Uh, the IBM Academy is actually where, supposedly, where the top scientists are until they elected me. <laughs> uh, um, 
And, but my, my day job is actually I manage a university relations for IBM in uh, Europe, uh, Middle East, and Africa. Okay. Among the things I do is actually I go around and look at uh, uh, interesting research projects uh, uh, where we think that there will be big impact uh, to the society, uh, big impact in technology, and we try to fund it. And that's one thing we do. Second, second thing I do is uh, try to help universities to develop the skills uh, for their graduates so that when they graduate, they can get jobs easily. Uh, and the third jobs I do uh, in my daily job is uh, looking for the best and the brightest to bring them to IBM. So quite egoist, okay? but that is the kind of job I'm doing. So it's my pleasure to go into uh, this presentation. Okay. Uh, we believe that okay, we are passing uh, from a tabulating system era to programmable system era to cognitive system era. Okay. So in order to what I mean by cognitive system, then we look at the definition here. Okay. That means uh, cognitive computer system learn and uh, interact uh, naturally with people uh, to, the extent, uh, to the extent that neither the machine or people can do that well separately. Okay. But the most important point is the system learn and mimic the way our brain work. That's what I mean by cognitive system. So don't worry that the cognitive system is going to replace us. Not yet. Okay? They are there only to work, to assist us, to augment our capacity. Okay? So, uh, so you can look at it from tabulating to program programming. But what is really triggering cognitive system? Actually, the whole point is big data. You hear a lot of big data, but you say, what the heck? It depends on what we do with it. Eh? But big data poses a technical a technology problem very simple. It is we cannot do anything with it unless we change the way we do computing. Eh? So the big data, uh, with the fact that there are a lot of data, they, uh, they have continuous data, they have high speed, they have uh, um, a variety of the data is not only structured data, but non-structured, photo, video, a lot of things. And the question is, do we have the technology to process them? And works, the data we have are not reliable either. Okay? So these are the things considered a challenge for technology. And that is the consequence is we are at the turning point right, to transform the, the regularly, uh, the regular IT information technology to a higher level. Okay, okay that is the reason why you see I call social, mobile, cloud, big data, analytics, these things are the, the, tipping, the tipping points or the triggering point okay, that push us into a turning point in computing. So I have the definition, I talk about the evolution in computing. Huh? So what is the thinking point? Actually, when IBM create the Watson system and win the Jeopardy challenge, eh, that is my story. The Jeopardy challenge, I don't know how they are familiar with it, but it's more or less like a question for a champion. Eh? That is a rapid Q&A. It cover what? Okay, it <coughs> it has a broad open domain to look at. Okay, complex new natural language language and very complex the way they pose the question, and then uh, we need a high uh, precision uh, response, accurate with accurate uh, uh, confidence, and within three seconds. Okay? And that is the rule of the game. And actually, we beat the two champions. Uh, the human champion in the U.S., and that is the turning point. And you see that language, national language, is extremely complex. 
You look here. Okay. Uh, why do we say no, sir? That run and fit that smell. It's just against the conventional wisdom. Right? And then how can we say that a slim chance and fat chance are the same? Slim is skinny and fat and why, why the two adjectives there uh, attribute to the same meaning. Right? And then why a wise man and a wise guy are opposite, although both of them are wise. So that is the complexity of national language. And then uh, the example here, uh, how can we say a house will burn up when it burns down? Right? And then I said, well, we fill out a form, uh, we, fill, uh, uh, we fill in a form by fill it out. In and out, that should be two notions completely different. Right? And then how does an alarm go off by going on? Right? Off and on is two different notions as well. So that is the complexity of natural language. And it's so hard to teach a computer to understand that. That is a big challenge. Okay, so now, how do we do it? If you look at, well, all of you are familiar with a search engine like Google, no, Yahoo, whatever, okay? Then what you have is you have a question, okay? Then <coughs> you, the question is condensed into one or two keywords. They go to the system, okay, find the elements contained in that keywords, and send, maybe send back a, 1,000 possible answer or 100,000 different answer, and it's up to you. Okay, you look at result and make the decision on that. That is a typical function of a search engine. You type in, okay, my name in search engine, and you see, okay, they put out a lot of things. Whoever had more or less the same name like me. Okay. So what is the difference with Watson? Eh? Watson have a question. Then send in the question, maybe in the case of Watson, during the Jeopardy game or challenge, okay, a two or three sentence question. Then they decompose the question, they understand the question, okay, produce a possible answer and look for evidence to support the different answers there. So we have each answer attached with a level of confidence. and. Going back there, and it's up to you to make decision. And most of the time, you will get the, the answer with the highest level of confidence. That is the difference between the Watson game and the search engine. Okay, so in short, what does that mean? That means the system understands natural language and human communication. Okay? It generates and evaluates evidence-based hypothesis. Then it go back, it adapt, provide the answer with level of confidence, but it can learn uh, and store in the additional information for future use. So the system, you can come out, if imagine the difference between Watson and a typical search engine, okay? At uh, zero, that means at the ground level. That means you have no data whatsoever. You ask question, actually, it will search for the answer and come back using that keyword and come back with thousands of answers. But then when you put in more, more, more data in there, then the system can detect the pattern, right? And the answer become more refined with the level of confidence. And we find the more data coming in, the, the patterns will be more refine and more patterns, and then you have more, more evidence to support the, the hypothesis that the system proposes. So eventually, the answer you have, have a clear evidence to support that hypothesis, right? So here, what we have, if we look at the normal way we're doing things is in what we call the scientific method is where we think, we, we observe what around us in physics, in social science, we look what happened around us and say, ah, I think that may be the case. So it's a human-driven hypothesis. And then we go out, we look for data to support or to deny that hypothesis. And if it turns out it's, 
it support that hypothesis, then say, ah, I have a theory of what's going, what's going on. Right? And then you use that theory, you go out and you validate it. Right? That means give you some predicting power of what uh, uh, your hypothesis is. And if you can predict it, then you say, ah, that is a theory whether in natural science or social science. That's the way we call scientific method. Right? Here, what we have is, imagine if you have big data, that means you are lucky, you can collect all the data you have. Then eventually, okay, the data can seek out the patterns and propose the pattern. Right? Then they look for the evidence, right, the percentage of confidence on each hypothesis. Right? And the key point is learn, the system is learning. So the more you deal with that, the better her hypothesis will be. And at the end, I mean, you have a uh, data-centric, okay, evidence-driven hypothesis instead of a human-driven hypothesis. And that is the method. Okay, to give you the difference between the way we look, we you look for keywords matching in the answer, okay? For here, this is the example. Okay, the question is, this is the real question in the uh, Jeopardy uh, um, game, okay? In May 1898, Portugal celebrated the 400th anniversary of this explorer arrival in India. So the question is, who is this uh, explorer, okay? So of course, okay, if you do, you decompose the question with different keys was celebrated in May uh, 1898, okay, 400 anniversary, Portugal, India, arrival, explorer, etc. Okay? <laughs> then do you look for evidence, okay? You look for evidence. Of course, you look at one of, you search in your text data, I mean, uh, the, uh, the, encyclopedic data you have, okay, you end up with something like, okay, in May, Gary arrived in India after he celebrated his anniversary in Portugal. If you look at Kigo matching, they are good. There's so many matching. Arrived, celebrated in May, anniversary, Portugal, India. So they say, ah, wow, I got the answer. Eh? So you say Gary is an explorer, okay? But unfortunately, and you see that, okay, yeah, it is the answer, but uh, the system must learn right, um, that the keyword matching may not be the best solution possible. Okay? Look at another alternative, the same thing, okay, the same question, okay? Decompose the question by different keywords. Right? But we have a, a deeper analysis, okay? We find another evidence, another example here. On the, 20, on the 27th of May, 1498, Right, Vasco the Gamma landed in uh, Cap Beach, Cap Beach. Right. Now, if you look at it, okay, you have Marching here. Landed in um, 1498, that is 400 years okay, later. Okay, you have date March, you have paraphrase March, like arrival in, so you have landed in. Okay. Uh, Cap Beach is in India. It requires a deeper analysis and deeper knowledge of the evidence. Okay? So eventually, okay, you conclude that uh, Vasco the Gamma is the explorer relating to the question. So, I mean, search far and wide, explore many hypotheses, uh, okay, find and just evidence, right? and use using many inference algorithms. And that makes Watson more reliable in the way you look for the answer. Okay, so how does it do? To summarize what I described is actually when you have an inquiry, okay, uh, then you decompose the inquiry. And sorry, I don't know why we have problem there, okay. Then we generate, or we use uh, the answer software to look for different potential, okay hypothesis, and then we use evidence database to confirm that. But you see, we have different paths. We have a path from here, okay, here, or here, etc., and go back to the synthesis before we look for the final answer with the confidence level. Okay. 
an answer. If you look at it, okay, we can, um, we have a multiple inter interpretation of the question, right? We have hundreds of different sources uh, to generate a possible answer, okay? Then we have thousands of different pieces of evidence we have to look into, and uh, we have 100,000 of score in deep analysis in order to generate, uh, okay, and the final confidence level in the answer. Oh yeah. But that is Watson at play. That is a contest against jeopardize challenge in the jeopardize challenge. So we have only one user. But the Watson, now if we talk at the Watson at work, uh, we have tens of thousands of concurrent users. Okay? Other side we have maximum like the input, I said one or two sentences. Here you have a uh, okay, uh, page of input, uh, look at like the example of medical records or many other things, okay? Then we train in a limited time, but here it work, it will be a dynamic content, content injection. That means the system learning more and more when you have more data. And actually, we have so much data every day, the way we look at, okay? You know the big data because, because we have all kind of data imaginable out there. Especially we have sensors everywhere, we have iPhone, we have iPod, we have so many things that can give you the information. And the question is what to do with it. <coughs> okay. In in the Watson at play, the way we did it, we didn't care much about everything. Well, we did care about evidence, but not the way if we want to use it at work seriously. Okay. So the evidence is an integral part in the analysis. Okay. Uh, in the game we play, it was only tricks. But in reality, when we have to work, you know that uh, we have all got structure, on structure data, video, photo, everything else. Okay. And the Q, it was only a Q&A model. In the real work, especially the things we did in, in uh, healthcare, for example, it has to be in the converse, conversational mode with the user. Okay. And um, in the game, okay, security is not a primary concern, but when we do, in the case of healthcare, you know that the security and the protection of data is extremely important. That's why we cite a, a high part that is the, the Health Information Protection and Accountability Act in the US as an example that whatever we do, we have, we have to observe strictly the, com the compliance and the law of the country. Okay, so, okay, what have we done? Okay, in, uh, like I said, we started the project in 2006, okay, and we won the game in 2011, and from there we said, ah, now we can put it to work. So we focus in, uh, from 2011, we focus on healthcare. Actually, we, we work with uh, two institutions in healthcare. One is about uh, focus on the operation, the other is focus on disease protection and detection, uh, in particular uh, in cancer. Then we work with banking, financial institution to use uh, with big data, try to use Watson. And that is we start from 2012 on. Okay? And now we start uh, to do, to collaborate with other industries in order to be sure that, okay, they can take advantage of the technology in Watson to do, uh, to enhance their capacity capability, okay? So the potential user here, you can see healthcare service provider, government healthcare insurer, and you can empower patients because this, we, we help in education institution, in research and finance banking, especially in research, okay? If we use it correctly, imagine in research, for example, in pharma company, doing research to create a new drugs, okay? Well, 10 years ago, it cost about five, what, $800 million to create a new drug. Uh, we talked only about a month ago. Okay? They said that it cost uh, $2.2 billion to create the new drug. Uh, well, I, I would advise you not to believe in it because uh, a lot of pharma companies just push up <laughs> the number in order to gain on the IP protection. Okay? But anyway, 
the, the one thing you know for sure is it's very, very costly to create a new drug. Imagine if we can use Watson to accelerate the discovery. Imagine that we need to detect some patterns, some pathology in the disease and some pattern in the potential uh, uh, drugs which can match and can help to treat the disease. Okay? That's what we call accelerated discovery. And if we can reduce from 800 million to 400 million, you see, make a big difference. And that's why, okay, in research in institute, in pharma companies, that is something we can help to make a difference. What, uh, whatever Watson came 